Welcome to the next in our series of podcasts on the Catholic intellectual tradition. Our guest today is Dr. Robert Schaffern, Professor of History at the University of Scranton. Welcome, Dr. Schaffern. Thanks for having me. So could you start off by telling us about your own education? Well, I was a Catholic school kid from kindergarten to PhD. I attended our uh, parish school. I I grew up in uh, central Chicago. Uh, Then I went on to uh, a resurrectionist high school, which is now no longer there. And then DePaul University for my undergraduate and uh, Notre Dame for a PhD in medieval history. Uh, What effect do you think going to such a high school, the Catholic high school, had for you in terms of what you pursued later on in your educational It actually was critical. Uh, uh, My history teacher in high school, Mr. Mr. Peter Morrison, uh, was the only uh, teacher at the school who taught ancient and medieval history. And um, at the time, what uh, you could do was either take ancient and medieval history or take world history. And I heard nothing good about the fellows that taught world history. I had heard a lot of good about Mr. Morrison. And he was as good as, uh, he was as, good as advertised. So he, uh, uh, he got me going. And then, uh, interestingly enough, one afternoon I was in our library and just looking around for a, maybe a book to, to take off the shelf. And it's probably not uh, widely known, but the science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov, wrote history books for young adults. And my eye fell, on a, fell upon uh, a title, uh, and the title was Constantinople, the Forgotten Empire. And so it was a history of the Byzantine Empire for 12-year-olds, basically. And I read that, and I was absolutely hooked. Between that and Mr. Morrison's classes, um, you know, I fell in love with the stuff, and, and here I am, uh, you know, uh, more f- 50 years later. It's, it's all still good. So what did you do your Ph.D. thesis on? What was the topic? It was on indulgences. Uh, I had no real, uh, th- these days apparently, uh, young people come to graduate school already knowing what they wanted to do. I had very little inclination about that when I started. But my director, uh, John Van Engen, who's now retired, uh, we had a meeting after I took my candidacy exams, and uh, he said, what about a dissertation? I said, well, you know, I could use some suggestions. I'm not real sure. Uh, I had a couple of ideas in my head, but the problem was linguistics. Or I mean, not linguistics, but language ability. And so he said, well, you know, the, the world could use a, a dissertation on either indulgences or on simony. Simony, I thought immediately, and I think it was right, uh, was too big a thing. Uh, would, would have, I would have floundered. Uh, but indulgences weren't. Uh, and in checking out the historiography, nothing had been done in a long time, and nothing had been done in English in a long time. Uh, the last uh, history of indulgence was 1896, done by a very Whiggish uh, uh, professor of history at uh, Penn, uh, who uh, you know believed in the you know awfulness of the Inquisition and all this kind of stuff. So um, so uh, we picked the topic, and then. Uh, he wanted me to do a topic uh, that would involve uh, the reading of a manuscript. Uh, and uh, um, so I poked around a few catalogs, and we had another meeting, and he said, what did you find? I said, how about this guy? Uh, a lesser-known uh, Dominican, German-Dominican theologian, died in 1372. And uh, John said to me, Is that, that was the one I was thinking. So we both thought, okay, here's this, you know, we're off to a pretty good start here. And um, uh, I, I finished pretty quickly. Um, unfortunately, John was sick much of the time that I was writing, and so I lost a little bit of I lost a little of his input, uh, which um, kind of slowed me down. But then one of my directors kind of it was, it was one of my readers was essentially a co-director, uh, uh, basically, and uh, he he provided me with a lot of wonderful input, um, classically constructive criticism and. So I got the first draft done, I put those changes in, and there it was. So the document you were reading, was it in Latin? In Latin and in manuscript, yes. Mm. Why do you think no one had written about indulgences for so long? Well, for one, I mean, on the Catholic side of it, um, since Vatican II and with the ecumenical movement, uh, indulgences were a kind of embarrassment. Mm. I was just, in fact, I'm reviewing a book now uh, that was, it's a, uh, has the papers of a French conference on indulgences. 
And the last essay that I read said precisely the same thing. There was not a whole lot of work done on indulgences going back to uh, Vatican II and even a little bit before that because they were a kind of embarrassing topic for Catholics and with the ecumenical drive, this was something that divided us basically. So that explains it. Uh, as far as the Protestant side was concerned, there was some work uh, done by Protestant scholars, almost all Germans, um, in the wake of German reunification. And for them, this was the, this was the issue that, dis that divided us good Germans from each other, Catholic versus Protestant. And, uh, they, you know, that, and uh, that lasted basically up until the First World War when all those nationalist preoccupations of Germans came to a crashing end. So that's, th those are the two uh, main reasons that they attracted so little attention. So what about your academic work after that? What did you study? Uh, what do you mean, like in scholarship? Anything, or? scholarship. Well, scholarship continued to be about indulgences primarily. And uh, so I, I, I did two books, uh, a whole slew of articles. Um, of late, and having done um, you know, some very careful scholarly types of things, I, I also uh, tried doing some more generalist approaches. So I've got a law book. Uh, on, uh, that I use in my jurisprudence class. And right now, I'm quite near finished, I hope and I think, a biography of St. Peter, actually. Okay. And I've started a couple other books, one on the politics of the Renaissance period and the other on um, uh, nobility in, uh, in traditional Europe. So the, those are the couple of things I'm working on right now. So in terms, so since you know the, the time period so well, in terms of Catholic intellectual tradition, Catholic intellectual thought, what effect did that early Renaissance have on the thought? Well, it's, it's an interesting uh, thing because it actually, um, uh, what, what happened was that in the Renaissance, history became sort of the queen of the sciences, right? The, theology was the queen of the sciences for the scholastics, mm -hmm. teaching in medieval universities. For the humanists of Italy, it was history. Uh, everything you studied was to get you to the point of being able to read the old histories, uh, uh, Roman histories, very, very few Greek. But to get to the Roman histories, read them in Latin, uh, to, uh, for one, uh, cultivate a polished Latin style, uh, and also to um, broaden one's intellectual horizons. The idea was uh, of intellectual facility rather than trying to ch rather than trying to train someone for a particular job uh, and then moral training. Uh, the, the humanists were convinced that by reading the Latin historians, the old Roman historians, those three very desirable things could be cultivated. <clears throat> so they did a lot of that. Now the, that, mo that movement, however, ran up against the same problems that ancient historians did. I mean, the, the, what, what, it, what, you know, the, the, the Italian humanists were acquiring this log jam almost um, unconsciously, but they were doing it because their sources had the log jam. And the log jam was uh, Greco Roman determinism. Okay? So, this notion that history has to go in a certain direction, or uh, certain things had to happen, whatever happened had to happen, that was one thing. And this notion of a cyclical view of history that it always comes back to where it was. Now, <clears throat> uh, this, the, the, the broader historiographical tradition was freed from that by St. Augustine, and particularly in the City of God, where he made the very powerful argument that history is not cyclical, that in fact it's linear, uh, that these apparent um, that the that the apparent cyclical process of history was just that it was only apparent and it was only apparent if you had already accepted greco-roman determinism that's what that's what stymied a lot of renaissance historiography and what broke out of his what broke out of that actually was the jesuit contribution to that uh, particular branch of study the jesuits came into it uh, of course they had the uh, apologetic purposes of uh, of providing answers to the Protestants. And so history was a, uh, an important part of their approach to 
the Christian intellectual tradition in a way that was probably not true for the scholastics. Um, and, in, uh, and in recovering church history, they also recovered that uh, preeminently Christian historiography that, in fact, it's linear, uh, in fact, it's richer than what uh, a lot of past uh, thinkers have permitted. Uh, and, uh, and so here we are, you know, all these years later, uh, hopefully carrying on this tradition, we'll, you know, we'll see. Um, but uh, um, it, was, uh, it was really the, the Society of Jesus that, uh, the, the, the great uh, intellects of the Society of Jesus, that once again got uh, the Western uh, way of thinking about history out of its kind of Greco-Roman determinist cocoon and provided for a contingency, provided, and, and really provided for a rather more interesting story. I mean, if we, if we already know how the story is going to end, we're less likely to pursue it, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, from, from the Augustinian Jesuit point of view, we know that it's going to end in some purpose that suits providence. But exactly what that entails is not yet known to us. Uh, we might, you know, we might uh, discern a, an insight here or there, but the broader tradition, the broader movement is known but to God. So in that period of time, much of the intellectual work done in the Catholic Church was in response to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, what effect do you think that had on uh, classical Catholic thought? So in, in one example, say, did it pull us farther away from the Eastern Church in trying to answer the Protestants? Uh, did it separate us more from that church of the first century, or the first millennium? Well, it didn't. Uh, let me answer the second question first, because it didn't. What, what happened, uh, one of the polemical purposes that both sides had at the beginning was to be able to claim the tradition of the Ecclesia Primitiva. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the Protestants claimed that we represent the Church of the Apostles, so did the Catholics. So one of the tasks then of church, histor of church historians in particular was to go back into the sources, and this is when Greek actually became as uh, frequently studied as it was. Uh, the old uh, humanist curriculum, there were people like Bruni and a few others that knew Greek pretty well, but they were the exception. Uh, with the advent of the Reformation, Greek became part and parcel of Protestant historiography and Catholic historiography. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, the chief figure here was a uh, was, a, was a bloke known as uh, Cesare Baronio. Uh, he was put in charge of the Vatican Library for a number of years. Um, and he went through the sources and found uh, all sorts of connections, uh, particularly institutional ones. That was, the, uh, that was his chief preoccupation. Uh, that is to say, to, uh, to show how the, um, for instance, the, uh, uh, the apostolic succession of bishops went back into history and into uh, the, uh, the apostolic period. Uh, the Protestant reply was that this all basically came into, uh, came into existence with Constantine. And it was clearly not true. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, it actually put us in, uh, it actually discovered more of what was going on earlier on uh, than otherwise. Of course, one of the, one of the things that um, was uh, fruitfully inherited from the earlier Renaissance tradition was sources. Find sources, find the materials that you can. And of course, uh, that started with Petrarch. He found the letters to Atticus all through the Middle Ages that they thought were gone. Um, things like the, and, and more recently, things like the discovery of the Didache uh, at St. Catherine's in Sinai in the 1890s. Uh, nobody had known about that text for years. So. So, and that was the first century, the first century text? That was, uh, sure, uh, that, that those and the letters of Clement, for instance, and whatnot, talking about, uh, and, and, and Ignatius of Antioch, you know, maintain communion with your bishops, worship with your bishops. Both of those figures emphasized unity with the bishop, uh, among, you know, among other things. But as far as uh, the relationship with Eastern Christianity was concerned, I think it's largely kind of a wash. Um, uh, 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 an interesting story is that early on, Luther and some other Protestants said, well, we hate the Pope, the Orthodox hate the Pope, so we should have a lot in common. 
And so some Protestants made overtures to the Orthodox. The Orthodox said, no, you're all a bunch of heretics uh, for rejecting nature and grace and the sacraments. And uh, um, so it re I think in the, in the end, uh, neither closer nor further away. Reading the Didache, I, it, it's amazing to me how similar it is to modern Catholic thought, I think, uh, that in 2,000 years, the, the central message is almost exactly the same, even right. in practice, it, it, uh, where the argument is that we've changed over 2,000 years and, and uh, got interested in different things and separated ourselves from the scriptures. I think those documents show that the church has not, that we've, made, we've maintained a fidelity to our original message. Yeah, and you know, here Newman is eminently helpful with his idea of the development of doctrine. It's not that <clears throat> the church's teaching has changed, uh, but it is that uh, you know, generations, uh, given their own experiences, ask questions of the deposit of faith. Certain answers out of the deposit of faith are uh, are arrived at there. But uh, one, of my, one of the other things that was very striking to me as a graduate student too was looking at medieval liturgical texts. And as a lifelong worshiping Catholic, this to see that these people, you know, a thousand, a thousand plus years ago, were largely doing the same thing that I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was, a, for me, there was a great human connection there. And I think in, in anybody who can be interested in history for his or her entire life, you've got to be able to connect, to have a, a human connection with the people whom you're trying to study. Uh, and it's, this, this takes place in a lot of different ways, not only by what's been thought, but just for me anyway, of sitting at a desk in the British Library and looking at something that somebody wrote in the 1300s and the 1400s, and I still have that in front of me. Uh, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bond there. It's, it's a very humane endeavor uh, that, uh, that uh, has appealed to me my whole life long. Do you think if it hadn't been for the church, both the Catholic and the Orthodox, that we would have lost all of the knowledge of the ancient world and uh, the writers of the ancient world? It would, uh, well, it's hard to see how it would survive. Um, the manuscripts were all copied by monks, and the monks had religious intentions. They had religious purposes. Um, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, we have the old, uh, the old category of the Dark Ages. But the, the more we plumb the, the sources, the more we realize how undark the ages were. To be sure, there was violence and confusion and whatnot, but for just a couple of readings that I had done recently, uh, um, monks, uh, right, their, their day involves the divine office, the year involves the liturgical calendar, and all that's based on a reckoning of the seasons. Well, that means that you've got to be able to compute uh, uh, certain mathematical equations. It also means that you need to have certain astro, uh, uh, astrological observations. Mm. Uh, and so um, medieval, even in the darkest of the dark ages, medieval monks were coming up with uh, new ways of uh, arithmetic uh, computation, uh, of uh, revisiting uh, tables of planetary motion and things like that, and not only that, um, another thing, and another thing, of course, was uh, was the liturgy itself. It was, you know, uh, there's often this notion that it's not a very uh, creative era. Well, anybody who's seen Byzantine art knows it's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and even in the West, where we have very much less that survives, but. The, the liturgical creativity of the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries in Western Christendom are really quite amazing. Mm. Um, there's all sorts of um, traditions being reconciled. Uh, something's dropped out. Something's uh, remained within uh, the liturgy, both the Mass uh, and the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, uh, that, that, that all represents a substantial investment of intellectual resources. Um, even if you're not a religious person, it seems to me you have to, you, at least, at the very least, you have to make that concession. It's very interesting that you said that because one of the things I wanted to bring up were how dark were the dark ages because I find, uh, I find myself very drawn to the music and to the art of that era. To me, it seems more like a lack of infrastructure. Ideas could not be exchanged because there was no political infrastructure in, in Europe that allowed for 
you know, free movement and things like this. It was a, a political dark ages in that sense. The, with the Roman Empire gone and before, you know, modern nation states, it was much harder to say somebody in France to communicate with somebody in Germany to communicate with somebody in England. Uh, so you were much, much more isolated. But it seems that in the monasteries, they were doing some very intelligent, very interesting things. Uh, and I, it seems to me that that was the time, say, starting with the cathedral schools, that education really started to flourish. Uh, the church needed people who were, as you just said, intelligent and well-educated. There were always schools. Uh, earlier on in the Middle Ages, there were almost all monastic schools. It was Charlemagne, who died in A14, uh, who made the promulgation uh, that every uh, bishop should maintain a school attached to his cathedral. Now, of course, a lot of them didn't, and a lot of them couldn't. Um, however, um, you know, again, it, we talk about a Carolingian Renaissance, mm -hmm. and was there a lot of original creative work done the, during the Carolingian Renaissance? Probably not. But what was vital uh, was the preservation of what had been set down in the past, and uh, contacts with the Greek world actually during the Carolingian Renaissance became more frequent. Uh, and they were actually even more frequent earlier on. After all, uh, Italy was under the rule of, or Rome was under the rule of Constantinople from 553 to 753, 200 years. And 200 years in those days was just as long as it is now, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so people went back and forth between Constantinople and Rome. Most of those were religious um, uh, and, and, and it had some training in these uh, and some training in these disciplines. Um, it was also at that time that the, uh, iconoclasm happened in the East, and I think a lot of the, the artists of the East moved West. To well, or, and even when uh, Justinian conquered Italy, and the conquest was done by 553, uh, the great churches of Ravenna particularly, because mm -hmm. at that point Ravenna was the capital of Italy, was no longer Rome. Churches of San Vitale and uh, Santa Paula, both Santa Polinare, they're they're I mean they're amazing. I've been privileged to visit the Church of uh, San Vitale, and uh, um, we almost did it on a lark. One of our Roy Domenico and I were taking students every other uh, every other year, and uh, um, Roy said, "Why don't we stop in Ravenna this time uh, on the way from Florence to Venice?" And I said, "Beautiful, let's do it." And we walked into the church, and what was what was really uh, uh, amazing to me was the students just went oh I mean they were they were just overcome by the beauty of the church it was it was really a, a, a magnificent moment and one now that you know these days if I can just get off the, off of this topic just a wee bit um, because I hear a lot about doing this you know we, we need to do something new we need to you know not doing the same old thing anymore well for one for our students, it's not the same old thing. They've never heard it before. Mm -hmm. uh, and for another, nothing gets to be old unless it has something to be said for it. Uh, and I think that uh, um, it's going to be a challenge, and I'm almost at the end of my career now, but it's going to be a challenge for the next couple of generations of Catholic teachers and scholars to hand down this wonderful body of learning, uh, this wonderful body of music and of the visual arts uh, it's going to be harder to do that uh, go, uh, in uh, in the coming generations, I think. So what do you think the role is of history in the Catholic intellectual education? So, I mean, where do you, how much history do you think our students should take, both in a high school and a college setting, to preserve these kind of ideas? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a, a big administrative question, and, and uh, I'm a poor administrative thinker. <laughs> but um, I think the short answer is as much as possible. Um, there's a lot, there, I mean, you know, there's a lot of material there. It's enormous. Uh, there are a lot of books to be read. Um, so I think what, but, but I think what the teacher then has to do is ask him or herself, what can I present to the students such that after they leave, because we don't, we only get them here in the university for four years. And then they're going to go on for another six decades or, or whatever of their lives. So, um, uh, we have to keep that in mind too. But I think what what uh, the the Catholic teacher needs to do is to ask him or herself, what are the things that are going to excite the imaginations of young, seriously, intellectually serious, young, intellectually 
engaged Catholics. Uh, ask themselves that question. And, it, and, and the answer is probably, well, what got me excited to begin with? I mean, are, are these kids that different from me? I think they're probably not. Um, and so I think, uh, um, you know, that is the basic editorial question for uh, uh, individual professors in the classroom and for deans and provosts uh, to, um, to ask themselves and, and, and say, you know, um, how are we going to continue Ignatian? Uh, how are we going to continue an education in the Ignatian tradition, in the tradition of Ignatius of Loyola, uh, one of the great spiritual luminaries, not only of the Catholic Church, but of the European uh, tradition writ large, um, and who uh, was a psychological genius, had all these, sort of, all, all these magnificent insights about what is, uh, what is possible for the human person. And another thing to keep in mind, of course, is that this is all a very positive thing. Um, uh, uh, Saint Fran the great luminary, St. Francis and St. Ignatius and, and others, uh, didn't walk around as gloomy gusses. They, they, were, they had the joy of the Christian. They, you know, uh, the creation was beautiful. It was fascinating. Uh, and uh, you know, Aquinas talking about, again and again, using the Aristotelian terms, every effect bears the imprint of its cause. And we talk here about finding God in all things. Well, those things dovetail. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. Um, uh, that, that's something that enriches lives. It's something that makes us better than we were before. Uh, that's what a really transformative education entails. So do you think we're at a crisis point then in education and that, um, as you said before, your Catholic high school no longer exists. Many people who went to gigantic Catholic high schools in, in the various cities in the United States no longer exist. Uh, the ones that do exist are often incredibly expensive. In our own city, um, we have Scranton Prep, which is a very, very expensive school, and even the diocesan school is very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, so are we at a crisis point where we're, we're in danger of losing this, this flow of, of historical and philosophical and theological education that has existed for so long and built up in our country? I think there is a crisis, and, I, and, and it's, you know, the crisis is also manifest in the number of people in the pews of priest friends who tell me that um, they keep baptizing uh, children that are born to unwed parents. Mm -hmm. uh, so the sacrament of you know, they have engaged in the sacrament of matrimony. Um, when our schools were first founded, the Catholics made enormous investments in those schools, and those schools were intended to train the neighborhood kids. And I, uh, one of the things that I've thought about a lot recently, and I'm also a candidate for diaconate, and I think that has uh, been partially responsible for this. And, I, and, and of course, you know, yes, we, we have to talk about the poor, we have to talk about the marginalized, we have to talk about people at the, at the peripheries. Uh, that is a gospel command. But what about the rest of us? We also have spiritual needs, we have spiritual aspirations. And I think we need to talk about those more for ordinary Catholics, just for, you know, for, for, for people in a suburban household or some such. Uh, I think that those are the people who actually have been failed in very serious ways. And I think it's time uh, for bishops particularly, and you know, this is going to be uneven because the, at least the American Episcopate is extraordinarily uneven. Um, but it's time to start asking us again, how can we, you know, how can we maintain these things given the financial straits that we're in? We are, I mean, here in the United States, we're a wealthy church. We should be able to fund this without any trouble, really. Um, so then the question is, why aren't we? What, what have we done? What have we thought of? Uh, where, for instance, maybe we could put our schools more on and, uh, you know, fund our schools through endowments. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that way, pay our teachers. I mean... Um, we do, ha you know, we do have the challenge, of course, of no longer uh, having uh, the volunteer labor that we once to have. You know, the, the nuns and the priests and the brothers who basically taught our, you know, taught our ancestors, grandparents, and parents for free. Mm 
that's gone, unfortunately. It's, it's, that, that is one of the real tragedies uh, uh, of American Catholic history in the last generation. I, 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 when I even talk about this, I was, I was, oh, I'm old enough to have been taught by sisters for six out of my eight grades in elementary school. And I tell my students this, and they, they just sort of you know, look at me like I must be some kind of an ancient relic, which I am, but, but there it is. <laughs> And I gotta say that there are times where I have to stop because the, the, the remembrance of how those religious women loved us really gets to me. It's, it, it, it makes me emotional. Uh, and and uh, you know, the idea that, that those of us who benefited from their ministrations, we really can't pay those nuns back. Hmm. You know, other than to try and do what they did for us, it's kinda, you know, it's kinda like parenting. Hmm. I think the fallacy that you're you're addressing here is the idea that uh, evangelization of a people just stops. Okay, they're evangelized, and then we call it yeah. quits. Evangelization is an ongoing process that has to be brought up to every new generation. Every every new person who's who becomes alive in this planet needs to be evangelized. Right. So we have this idea. Okay, you're you're of this race and this financial background. Okay, you're done. We're done with you. And then the, the faith and education in general just slips away from these people because it, it, it's, they're not the focus of anything. Right. Uh, where I think the church uh, needs to realize that these people need to be evangelized just as much as anybody else, just as much as the, the pagan running around the forest of Germany in the, in the year 1022 or something. Right. That they're, uh, we're, gener we're, we're raising a generation, I think, of pagans now in the United States who have almost no knowledge of religious matters and no knowledge of philosophical matters. Uh, I saw that someone had posted on Twitter the other day uh, that most of what people dislike about the Roman Church is not what the not what the Church teaches. Mm. Uh, that that of uh, um, uh, that that when Catholic teaching is presented to them as it ought to be and in its fullness, uh, they may not become Catholic, but at least they you know sort of oh that's kind of an interesting idea. Maybe it's worth entertaining, um, uh, and maybe even as a non-Catholic, I can take something away from that. Um, yeah, the, I mean, no, uh, uh, it's it's a continual source of frustration to me to talk about to, to listen to people talk about what they think the church is all about and what the church is in fact all about, mm -hmm. and they're, too often they're not the same thing. So what we what we also have, and of course it's connected to the educational issue and the educational difficulties. Uh, but we have a, a problem of catechesis. Um, you know, my, my grandparents, neither of whom graduated even from elementary school, knew more about the faith than most of my students do when they come into this place. Mm -hmm. And largely it's because they were regular, they, 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 and they never attended a CCD class, but they worship regularly. And in particular, they were there at the really dramatic points of the liturgical year, the Triduum, for instance, and so on. I mean, I remember like almost living in church during the during the Triduum when I was a boy, and well now too. Uh, and I'm glad to say that my children uh, like to do the same. Um, but, uh, um, uh, you know, for all this talk, and I still hear it from priests today, and, you know, people didn't know what was going on in the old days. Well, do you show up every Sunday for something you don't know what's going on? Hmm. You've got better things to do. So they knew, uh, even if they couldn't uh, necessarily articulate it uh, as, um, as, as someone who's a bit more facile with words could. I think that's a, a lame argument they present because, as you said, uh, attendance was much stronger then. Um, if they weren't getting anything out of it, they wouldn't have shown up. Right. Uh, now when we've made everything accessible, as they like to say, the, the churches are empty. So whatever we're doing, we're not doing the right thing. Um, I'm not advocating for any side of the liturgical arguments. Yes, you are. But I'm saying, <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying we, we need to really look at this seriously and see well, what but, we're doing. But, but I think too. I mean, one of the a distinctively Catholic way of looking at things is that it's all interconnected. So the education is connected to the catechism, which is like connected to the liturgy, which is connected to families worshiping together, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. Um, when you start to separate those, you know, goods in this life can be lost. Mm -hmm. and, it's a, and it's one of the most tragic things that we face. So how do we avoid that? Well, goods survive better 
they're more likely to stay in existence if we put them together, if they support each other. And that's, that's one of the foundational things about a Catholic life, that your professional life, that your family life, that your spiritual life is all connected somehow. And at the apex of that, of course, the, the, the only thing that really can hold it all together is prayer and liturgy. Uh, the other things really don't have the, they're necessary, but they're not sufficient to provide the wherewithal for a, uh, for a, uh, a life fully lived in imitation of Christ. So in, in the period of time that you study, in the, that medieval period, how did they view the Mass? I mean, would, uh, would they have viewed it any differently than we do today, you think? Well, it's very hard to say because we don't have a lot of, you know, sources from parishioners or whatnot. Now, but what we do have suggests that there are more commonalities, I think, than there are differences. Um, for one, for instance, you know, we are used to a church with frequent communion. In the Middle Ages, mm. that didn't happen. People generally communicated only once a year. So a lot of people went to, went to Mass without receiving communion. Uh, for them, uh, the, the, the high point of the Mass would not have been the receiving of communion, but the elevation after the consecration. Mm -hmm. That's what the, that was the, the, the real, uh, that was the climax of the Mass for them. So in that way, it was different. Of course, they, they did have, uh, the Mass was in Latin, but I would also suggest that why in the world do we have so many words in English that are derived from Latin? because people attending Mass all those years. Mm. Um, don't forget, too, that the priest, uh, most people lived in smallish villages. Uh, the parish priest would, probably would have been from uh, among them, some lad who's, you know, we need a priest for the next generation. Who do we think would be a good choice? How about him? Okay. Mm. Uh, and he might have a couple of curates around um, uh, to say, especially to say Masses for the dead. Um, Another thing that was different, of course, uh, or, or what seems to be the case, is that it looks like, and this is, this, a lot of this research is fairly preliminary, but I think it's going to hold up, that um, in years past, in the Middle Ages, people were more inclined to attend daily Mass than we are today. Um, don't forget, the, the, rec the, the, the day was different. Uh, it was an almost entirely uh, you know, the work day and activities were almost entirely decided by the sun. There were no lights. Mm -hmm. And if, anybody, if anybody's tried to do th anything by candlelight, you know how limit that, limited that is. So uh, in any event, you know, there, there was no time card to punch or anything like that. But up daily mass, and daily masses were not celebrated at the main altar in a church. They were all celebrated at side altars where the people would have been right around the priest. So they could have heard what he was saying, even sotto voce. Uh, they saw the gestures uh, rather more clearly. Um, and it was probably at those daily masses that a lot of the catechism took place. The other, uh, the other um, thing to be remembered about that is that daily masses were generally votive masses, so they were a mass for the dead or for some intention or other, and the intentions came from the laity, they didn't come from the clergy. Mm. So people knew to ask for a mass for a deceased relative, they knew enough to ask for a mass for, uh, we have a lot of uh, masses for pregnant ladies for safe delivery. Uh, for the health of animals, mm. the plow team dies, we're in big trouble, you know, the chickens die, we're all in big, you know, um, and there were paraliturgical services too, the priest blessing fields and blessing animals mm -hmm. uh, over the course of the day. So that uh, it was in those ways, uh, in those, uh, you know, uh, much more ritualistic mm -hmm. than we tend to, you know, than we tend to be as moderns. Uh, but those rituals had their way of appealing to the imagination uh, in signs uh, primarily and perhaps secondarily by words. It was in that period of time, as I understand it, 
that the tradition of the priest holding the, the, the host elevated above his head began because the people were demanding to see it. Yes. Because that was the apex. As you That's said, right. they, they weren't uh, frequent communicants. Right. But they demanded to see it so that when the priest was facing the altar, he needed to raise it high above his head, right. both the body and the blood, so that you can actually, they, they wanted to see this to be part of it. Yeah, Henry Adams uh, describes this beautifully in Mont Saint Michel and Char, his great classic on, uh, on medieval civilization. And um, at one point he asks, you know, what did the medieval parishioner want in liturgy? It's very simply, he, put, he wants to see God. He wants to see God. Um, yeah, of course, the, you know, the, 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 the other uh, uh, meaning uh, of the elevation of the host was that, you know, that here was a wide, you know, spread, commonly taken notion that that wasn't bread anymore. That that was Jesus. Um, I've sometimes had, uh, t- uh, you know, the occasion to joke with uh, non-religious friends, and you know, they ask about Catholicism, this and that. And I said, I'll tell them, you know, it's worse than that. We actually believe that a crust of bread is the Lord of the universe. Mm-hmm. And certainly, they did believe that in the Middle Ages. Uh, yeah. And I think um, at the at that time, and even later, that the the day was viewed more in terms of, as you said, it was governed by the sun but say like at noon when the sun was at at highest point you prayed the angelus right the bells rang and you could hear the church bells we're very far removed from that now our days are filled with just uh in my opinion a lot of nonsense right and we're wasting a lot of our days doing things that we don't find interesting at all just because it's a very hectic lifestyle now it was one of the it was one of the great beautiful carryovers for christian civilization from jewish civilization uh, you know, we, we read that the apostles and Jesus went to the temple at certain times of day. Peter sometimes went up to the roof <clears throat> at noontime to pray and so on. So there was already established in first century Judaism uh, a practice of praying at certain times of day. Well, that carried over into Christianity, carried over into the divine office. That's how long a tradition uh, it, it is. Uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, but, but, but also always a reminder that... <clears throat> Uh, that we were to be partners with God in be in being, uh, in creating, uh, in uh, becoming, um, and uh, uh, just a uh, um, a wonderful way of, uh, for one, slowing down a little bit. You know, modern life is enormously hectic. It, could, it, it couldn't be that way in the Middle Ages. They, they didn't have the techno, technological ability to do it. Um, but uh, there, I think there was also the notion uh, that, uh, well, one of the things that um, regular prayer does is to teach us that time is precious. And these days, as you say, we, we take up a lot of our endeavors with things that we could, might be better suited doing, uh, doing something else. Well, as we said, we're in a, uh, a crisis in Catholic education, but I think there's been, uh, historically, uh, there's been many crises in the church where it had to um, readapt. So uh, to me, the first one was, uh, not the first one, a very early one was when uh, the Roman Empire, at least in the East, decided to become Christian. Uh, do you think that that, th- that event forced us to modify Christianity in any way? Did we, did we soften our message because now we were aligned with the, uh, uh, an imperial force? I don't think it softened the message. It did change a lot. Um, uh, Constantine's, Re- Constantine's reforms, for instance, not only, ex- you know, not only extended to the Roman state, but also uh, influenced the church in terms of liturgical spaces among uh, a host of other things. Um, it, and I, it seems to me that that you know the church is not of the world, but the church is in the world, and so that's going to make a difference from age to age. Uh, but again, I think Newman is useful here. Uh, uh, the deposit of faith is the same, um, but over the centuries, uh, we understand it maybe a little differently, a, a little more richly. Certain, I mean, the, the word, for instance, transubstantiation. <laughs> did not come into general use until uh, about the 12th century or so, 13th century. Uh, homoousios is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Neither is, no, neither is the word Trinity, for that matter. Mm. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, so these things do happen. Um, the, 
the, the, the problem becomes when the culture overwhelms the deposit of faith. And um, I think there are a lot of us who believe that that happens a little too often these days. Hmm. So in that ancient Greek and Roman world, uh, they had very different values than the Christian values. I mean, they, they valued strength and power and not humility, not compassion, right? Compassion was a weakness. And they, they viewed Christianity as a feminine kind of very mm -hmm. weak religion until Christianity eventually overwhelmed them and, and mm -hmm. they became that. Um, do you see that, that influence, though, of the Greek and, and Roman thought did it come into the church in, in sort of a strange way? Did we, did we inculcate that into Catholicism and just readapted it for our, from our point of view? Well, there's a couple of different streams here, of course. Um, one of the things that uh, Christians noticed early on, and I'll mind you, um, the, the church had been intellectually engaged from the first generation. The, the church fathers were very fond of quoting uh, First Peter be ever ready to give a reason for the faith that is in you. Okay. And it was very early on that intellectually substantive figures like Clement of Rome, like Ignatius, like Clement of Alexandria, and a whole host of others had come into the church. Some of them were, uh, like the Cappadocian Fathers, were all cradle Christians and so on. Um, so uh, how uh, the effects came in is, well, you know, often summed up in the story uh, that, they, that the fathers told about the spoils of Egypt, uh, that, um, that the, herit the Greco-Roman heritage could be adapted unto Christian purposes, just as the children of Israel took the spoils of Egypt with them when they were freed from state slavery in Egypt. And I think <clears throat> uh, this has also happened just to a certain degree uh, these days, uh, we have some figures, uh, uh, I just read a book by Stephen Barr, who's a um, very distinguished uh, quantum physicist uh, and, and also a very devout Catholic, talking about the relationship between his faith and uh, his discoveries as a scientist, as a physicist and whatnot. Um, uh, so <clears throat> uh, anyway, get, to get back to the original question of Greco-Roman thought, I mean, essentially what thoughtful Christians did is some of them noticed that, for instance, the, uh, the, the substantial rhetorical tradition of the ancient world, that could be used unto Christian purposes, preaching and writing and whatnot. Um, other thinkers noticed that what the, uh, uh, more often than not, what the Neoplatonists had said sounds a lot like what we say, but they were careful enough to notice the differences too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, this issue of determinism, uh, you know, Platonism basically, Neoplatonism says that things turned out the way they had to turn out, that, uh, that God had to create the universe, right? That, that, mm -hmm. that was, and uh, Christian thinkers took a look at scripture and said, well, it couldn't have been that way. It had to be different because what Genesis describes is a universe that God created out of his will, that he wanted to do it. That he, want, that he did it out of his generosity uh, and, and love. Well, that's a pretty odd thing for, for Neoplatonists to say, who's not, a, who's not also a Christian at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we, we, we have been gifted in our tradition with a, any number of figures uh, who could separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, who knew that... Um, that the human being is gifted with reason and therefore is capable of understanding reality, but, to an ex but only to a certain extent. And, there, and there's the rub. Where is the, where is the one thing start and the other thing end? What separates the wheat from the chaff? Where are the Neoplatonists right? But where have they erred? Um, that, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, that uh, encapsulates a lot of the Christian intellectual enterprise. Today just happens to be the feast day of St. Justin in the Roman calendar, yeah. who was martyred for the faith. And he was very much part of that tradition, as you said. He was right. a Platonist before he was a Christian. And uh, uh, and I think that the way that they, they viewed this is that God was writing in the hearts of other people, not just the Israelite people. And so that while scripture was sacred, for sure, that the other people were 
could see natural law and could could experience right. God in their own right. right. So that this this was uh, simply uh, oracles. Yeah. So this is yeah. a precursor for Christianity in that in that point. Yeah. And I think you know that um, you know that that Christianity uh, very early on appealed to both Gentiles and Jews. Matters here. Uh, the Gentiles brought in a lot of. Um, what cultural baggage, for lack of a better word, uh, that the children of Israel probably weren't all interested in. And so, um, you know, uh, what Christianity could do and did very early on, and Justin is just one example of this, is of, uh, is of really being Catholic with a small c, of being universal, uh, that we're all children of God. We all have some gifts that God gave us, whether we're Christian or not. Uh, and uh, uh, and let's see where those let's see where those lie, uh, and let's see where we can find God in all things. Yeah. Yeah, certainly, you know, when I read uh, the Gospel of Matthew, say, or the letter to the Hebrews, which are primarily focused on convincing Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah, having been born a Catholic, it's it's not so interesting to me. So in the same way, <laughs> the Greeks were not so interested in in that kind of justification for the Messiah. They wanted a, a justification for the theology of Christianity in terms of their Greek philosophy, mm -hmm. right? So it made an extraordinarily rich tradition of intellectual thought, I think, right in Christianity right from the very beginning. And I think, too, um, uh, one, one of the things that um, is true of Christianity is that our most sublime thinkers have also something to say to ordinary believers. Uh, that um, uh, that ideas and truths, which may uh, have taken a lot of effort and creativity to arrive at, uh, can still be expressed to the mass of believers, uneducated folks and so on, in ways that are meaningful to them. Uh, because in the end, it's still about a personal relationship between oneself and God, and one doesn't need to be a great intellectual or, in order to do that, um, you know. Whereas, so again, in this in this ongoing discussion of what do we take from others and uh, uh, how is it different for Aristotle and for Plato, to be a human being was to be a rational animal. Now Christianity accepts that too, but uh, it's you know any any reader of Augustine. And any reader of Dante also knows uh, that to be a human being is to be a lover. And uh, uh, that that is something that you will not hear in Greco-Roman philosophy, really. Mm -hmm. um, but, it's a, but it's a truth nonetheless. And it also means that one of the, one of the um, Chesterton once said that every heresy has been an effort to narrow the church. And the hyper intellectualism there is the church to just you know people who are really smart, mm. and uh, and that's not what the church you know that that that's not it. Um, the uh, those of us who um, have been intellectually gifted, and have been all, and have been even more gifted with education to hone that talent, um, we have a responsibility to share um, to share uh, insights. Uh, about what it means to be a human being, what it means to be a Christian being, uh, with our with our fellows. It's never just about us. I mean, uh, this is another thing that separates, I think, that the the pagan Neoplatonists from the Christian Neoplatonists. You know, Plotinus was mm. kind of content to sit in his hut and contemplate all day long, and uh, um, for, you know, from the very beginning. And this was a question for Christians too, right? And the, the, the answer that came uh, most uh, celebratedly in Basil and Benedict was that contemplation also needs to be ordered to the service of one's brothers mm. and sisters. Right, since we're talking about these times of crises, uh, I'll take you a little outside of your uh, research interest in history. And let's talk about the, uh, to me, the biggest crisis that Christianity has faced, which was the, the era of communism where a concerted effort was made, especially in Eastern Europe, to destroy not just the faith of Catholicism, but the root, everything that Catholicism represented in their culture. Uh, since the fall of communism in many of those places, Christianity has uh, risen again in various, di different in different countries. Uh, so how do you, how do you see, what, how does the Catholic tradition 
survive in a place where people are being tortured and killed for it in the same way they were in the beginning in the Roman Empire? Well, that's a very good, you know, um, one part of this, of course, is that the sad fact of the matter is that persecution sometimes works. You can be mean and cruel and ruthless enough to destroy the church in a region. It has happened. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Um, with regard to what actually happened in Eastern Europe, um, the, uh, and I'll, I know best the, the, the example of Poland, um, for, you know, the, the Poles did maintain their faith, obviously, all through those periods. Um, it took extraordinary courage. It takes extraordinary courage. We're seeing some of this in Ukraine now mm -hmm. um, with, the, uh, Russian, uh, the, with the Russian incursion. Um, it also has to do with historical context. So, for instance, take, you know, Chechia. It's still a pretty non-religious place, mm. even though it's been liberated from communism. Well, it was a pretty non-religious place before the communists got there, so that you know, so that matters too. What happened? You know, what was the place like before the baddies get there? Mm. Um, if uh, you know, if if it was wavering prior to that, it's probably not going to do very well. Um, if it if it did, there's the possibility, but it's uh, you know, it's a tough thing. I mean. Henry VIII was just brutal enough to eradicate Catholic, you know, well, and, and it takes, the other thing too is that it takes a while. So for instance, at the end of, at the, end of the reign of Henry VIII, most Englishmen were basically Catholic in their sympathies. Mm -hmm. But when you put the reign of Henry VIII and Elizabeth together, well, then you're getting a couple generations that grow up without really knowing anything of the faith or that it's dangerous and so on. And quite frankly, most of us are not made of the stuff of martyrs, mm -hmm. you know. Um, for every martyr, there have to be, you know, I think probably rather more than one other person who went to, you know, burn the incense before the statue of the, uh, before the statue of the uh, emperor. Um, there's another way of looking at this, which I think may, might be a little more helpful, which is this. Uh, that in thinking about the future, Christians and Catholics need to think about what uh, the, the, they need to think about their relationship between politics, power, and the faith now. That is to say, are we going to say no when something inimical to Catholicism is proposed somehow, either culturally or politically? Um, uh, if that doesn't happen, um, you know, then, then you get the sort of ratchet effect, right? So anti-Catholic thing, anti-Catholic thing, anti-Catholic thing, anti-Catholic thing, and then over a span of time, you've got 40 years where it's been headed in this direction, and it's really hard to it's really hard to ratchet it back. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> um, I you know I think what happened in Eastern Europe uh, relative to the communist era was really kind of singular event in human history. Uh, and talking about it with my students, I I, I tell them I said. You know, this is, this is hugely unique because millions of people were liberated and almost nobody died. Mm -hmm. That rarely happens. That just rarely happens. Um, could it happen again? Most assuredly so. But would it happen again? Well, that's a question that remains to be answered. Why do you think the faith was so strong in Poland? Uh, and say, why did it essentially disappear, say, from uh, Bohemia, Moravia, those, those sorts of places? They're not that far apart. They're not that far apart culturally. Uh, but say in Slovakia, it, it, it was much stronger, stronger. And it was strong in Poland. So what, what, what part of their culture, what part of their national psyche was able to maintain it? Okay, well, the, the Bohemian-Moravian case also has a kind of history of its own. And uh, um, there's, a, you know, there's a longer story there of... Uh, uh, you know, of, of quote unquote nationalist movements versus the relationship with the Habsburgs, mm -hmm. who were the defenders of Catholicism in the modern uh, in the modern world. Uh, so that's uh, you know uh, often a tense and adversarial relationship, and that, that, I, that, and that still matters. So they were associated Catholicism with the Habsburg Empire, right? Yeah. Right, right, and uh, even when Ferdinand II. Um, 
re-Catholicize Bohemia during the Thirty Years' War, uh, you know, so you either have to convert or you have to get out. Um, you know, there were there were there were people who thought that was harsh, uh, and especially uh, now, you know, it's, it's it's actually part of Czech historiography that, you know, the the, the Habsburgs were our were our enemies. You travel in Hungary today, the same thing. Uh, you know, I, I remember once my wife and I were traveling in Hungary. You know, well, you know the Habsburgs this, the Austrians this, the Austrians that. And I said, well, it was the Austrians that got rid of the Turks. Did you, what about some gratitude? <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, they got rid of the Turks, but they stayed. So I guess the point was that they should, <laughs> never mind that the, the Habsburgs had the claim to the crown of Hungary, but uh, at any event. See, that stuff didn't happen in Slovakia. It didn't happen in Poland. Um, uh, uh, in Poland, there were, there were really no serious, uh, prior to, prior to uh, communism, uh, there weren't a whole lot of serious um, attacks on Catholicism. The Russians tried with Russification, the Germans tried with the Kultur conflict. The Kultur conflict uh, failed in, in Catholic Germany. Mm-hmm. It wasn't going to have much of a chance in Catholic Poland. Uh, and um, Russification was something that came in Long, you know, long after, uh, long after the the, the Russians occupied uh, what came to be called Congress Poland and so on, and there's also a there's also in Poland this um, another sort of unique aspect of her history, which was that as far, you know like Polish nationalism was largely the preserve of the nobility, the peasants really didn't give a hang. Mm. You know, because a lot of them were serfs. If they weren't serfs, someone else owned the land. You know, mm-hmm. I still have to pay my taxes to that guy, whether he's you know also recognized in the czar or so on. I don't care. Um, it was a much bigger deal, however, when Russification was introduced, uh, because it meant the replacement of Catholicism by Orthodoxy, and the, and the common folk were not going to have that. And. Uh, um, uh, the Russians, although they could be ruthless, weren't quite as ruthless as some other folks. And the Germans could be ruthless, but they certainly weren't as ruthless as some other folks. And the Austrians, well, uh, the, the Poles under Austrian rule were ruled by a, a Polish count. Hmm. So they tended to be pretty friendly to the Habsburgs, to tell the truth. Um, so all those things uh, um, enabled Catholic roots in Poland and in Slovakia to uh, penetrate very deeply into the ground. Um, and I think that's the largest reason why communism failed uh, in those regions, apart from the stupidities of communism itself. Hmm. Whenever I get discouraged, I remember what uh, Leo XIII, I think it was in Rerum Novarum, and uh, Pope Leo XIII said that that which is against nature cannot stand, hmm. uh, which is a good reason for us to cultivate the virtue of patience. So let me talk about something else you mentioned earlier. You mentioned the use of the Latin language. Um, Latin was not only the liturgical language of the West, but it became the universal intellectual language of the West. As opposed, so for example, Church Slavonic in the East was a liturgical language, but it was it did not spread out into the you know two mathematicians or physicists in <laughs> Slavic countries wouldn't use Church Slavonic to communicate, nor would they people in the Middle East use Syriac, for instance, even though Syriac maintained a liturgical language. So Latin sort of had that unique uh, place where it was both the intellectual language. The universal intellectual language and the liturgical language. Right. So, but now we've lost it as a liturgical language almost completely, uh, and we've lost it as an intellectual language. Right. So, so is there a? Do you think English will just take its place as a, a universal liturgical language, or have we lost a, uh, lost something that we can't get back? I think we've lost something we can't get back. Don't forget the Anglophone Catholic world is a minority. Mm-hmm. Right. Most Catholics in the world are Spanish speaking. I think. Um, and any, and any, at any rate, um, yeah, I, I, I think that chapter in the history of the church has largely closed. So of a, of a universal language. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, the, the Latin is still the official language of the Catholic Church, but now we have encyclicals that are being published in Italian. Yeah. Right. Not in not in uh, Latin. Well, and certainly when the College of Cardinals get together, they don't speak Latin to each other the way they used, used to. to yeah. They may there may still be a few guys who do that. Right. But in general, they're speaking Italian, they're speaking English, they're speaking French. Right. Uh, 
something like that. I mean, the Africans all speak English or French. Right. The Europeans all probably all speak English almost to a point, and right. then there you have the the South Americans who speak Spanish. Right. Um, and then you know various other languages, mm -hmm. but to, it, it wouldn't be the way that it would have been a hundred years ago, no. where they walked in and okay, they were all different different countries, so they just switched to Latin. Right, and in uh, fact, um, I just read a, a bit. Um, I mean, it's, that, that's not the only change, of course. Now, you know, uh, Francis has just nominated a, a, a whole slew of uh, new cardinals, and uh, um, so we also seem to be moving away from uh, sees that in the past had regularly been given a red hat, like Philadelphia, like mm -hmm. San Francisco, and so on. So um, uh, Los Angeles being passed over is the largest diocese in the United States, and, large, and, and a lot of it is Spanish-speaking. That, that, one that one's a, a complete mystery. Um, uh, what that means, then, too, is that when they assemble in conclave, <clears throat> fewer of the cardinals are going to know each other. In the past, you know, they've, they had their little clicks, yeah. if you will. Uh, that's probably not going to be the case anymore. Or at least if it is, yeah, the effect of it's going to be much more muted. Um, what that means, again, remains to be seen, I, I guess. Um, uh, for, uh, you know, speaking personally, I think there are seas that deserve a red hat regularly because there's so many Catholics who happen to live in those dioceses. Um, but uh, um, it's a it's a different world. Mm. So, linguistically, then, uh, you don't think that they'll move to a new language as a universal language. In other words, like say you go to Notre Dame. Well, Notre Dame's not working now. But when you went to Notre Dame or you went to some church like this on a Sunday when they had the international mass, that meant the mass was in English. Uh, and even if you go to say a church in Korea where the church is fairly strong, and they had an international mass, it was just in, in English. But English is not very popular, in, as you said, in Spanish-speaking countries, in South America, where there are a lot of Catholics. Mm -hmm. And uh, and besides that, the mass was supposed to be in the vernacular. Yeah. So, so why have an English mass in Paris? So you should just have it all in French. It seems to me that, yeah. Uh. Uh, so uh, does, does, that, does that create disunity in the Roman Rite, do you think? Because... It, uh, let me say, in the Eastern Rite, let's say, uh, the, the liturgy has always been in the vernacular, mm -hmm. uh, or allowed to be in the vernacular. Right. But we still say amongst the Slavic Byzantines, there was always Church Slavonic. Right. And we still have liturgies in Church Slavonic, sure. even in the United States. We have one tomorrow yes. in our church. Uh, so that we're not afraid of Church Slavonic, and we don't see it as some sort of political statement to do it. Whereas in the West, to have something in Latin now seems like to be a political statement. If you're having the modern Paul VI Mass in Latin, people get angry about it. Why are you doing this? Right? So we've really lost that notion of the universality of the liturgy. Right? Where, in other words, it's great to have the liturgy in, in, in your own language all the time, but every once in a while you do it in Latin, and you should learn the prayers in Latin so that when you're together with people of a different language, you can have something in common. Well, you've... You, what, um We've lost a couple of things. Uh, there's the sort of horizontal aspect, right, where you say if, you know, years ago, wherever you, know, if, wherever you entered a Roman Catholic church, the Mass would be in Latin, mm -hmm. there it was. Uh, then we were going to have a vernacular Mass, but not entirely vernacular, apparently. Mm -hmm. But then you also lose the, uh, the vertical connections of what, can, what happened in the past, and, right, right? So now <clears throat> with... Uh, um, Francis reversing Samorum Pontificum, uh, you know, defenders of the 1962 Missal <clears throat> uh, uh, will we'll quote uh, Benedict, you know, that the past, that the, the mass of the past is a sacred inheritance and mm -hmm. cannot be overthrown. And uh, uh, people, to, you know, people on the other side who would sort of, you know, want to forget about all that if, if not refute it out now. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, um, I'm one of those people who, um, thinks that every Catholic should study enough Latin to be able to understand it. We had missiles in the past, or even if, even if you hadn't studied Latin, you could follow along. And our Jewish pals still sell, still worship in Hebrew, uh, often, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kids who are raised in devout, Jewish families go to Hebrew school to, to, to learn the language. Uh, 
And uh, um, there are still some Catholic high schools, like the ones that my kids attended, uh, where if you're Catholic, you take two years of lab. Uh, I think that's there's all sorts of spiritual benefits to be had, and there are also cert- lots of other benefits besides, because when you study the grammar of another language, you understand better the structures of your own. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of, I mean, one of the things that uh, dismays all of us you know, who've been doing this for a while is the ability of young people to express themselves. You know, they can express themselves in a tweet, uh, but coming up with uh, even a, a brief essay uh, might be another problem. I was joking. I was joking with someone at graduation this year uh, about, uh, you know, set the world on fire. Heck, how about writing a coherent sentence? <laughs> you know? um, I think this idea of the universality of a language, though, falls on deaf ears to Americans because they rarely experience being in a place where not everybody speaks English. Where if I spend a lot of time in Belgium, and my friend who's a French speaker, we moved, we went 20 miles. So all of a sudden we're out of the French speaking mo- yeah. and we're now in the Dutch speaking place. Yes. And we went to a, a church in a, a, a very touristy town. And so everybody in the church essentially, the, the, the mass was in Dutch, and which I absolutely don't speak, but right. uh, everybody in the church was speaking a different language. They just, it was just, that was the 10 o'clock and it was in Dutch and it would have been better if it was in French, but it was in Dutch. <laughs> Uh, but like so it would have been wonderful if everyone in that church didn't know enough Latin and they just said let's just do this in Latin it's, we'll all learn Latin so that we can do this even if it's We've Novus Ordo I mean, you yeah, yeah, don't have to yeah. celebrate the Novus Ordo in, in the vernacular yeah. you can celebrate in Latin and the original Novus Ordo was supposed to maintain Latin in yeah, also it, was, it, was, it was never prohibited right. but it became prohibited de facto right uh, and I think I think that that, that, not, that idea that we cannot do it that way or that doing it that way is some sort of angry political act, which maybe it is sometimes an angry political act. It is for some people, uh, sure. But I think we've lost that uh, ability to maintain a unity in the in the Western Church. Yeah. Um, where in the in the Eastern Church, for example, in the Byzantine Church was much much smaller. Even uh, I have friends who are Orthodox, Carpatho Russian Orthodox, and their translation into English is different than ours. But when we sing into Slavonic together, it's all the same. Mm-hmm. So we have a language that even across the Orthodox Catholic divide, we can simply switch to, to, we all know the Slavonic well enough to do the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Mass. Right. We could do the liturgy. Right. We could do the liturgy. We could do lots of other things. So we could just switch to that and sing the hymns in Slavonic, and we all know what we're doing. So it's a, it's a unifying force that I think the West has sort of uh, lost that idea that this might be something that's important. Yeah, I think uh, another thing that uh, enters in here is the notion of unity. I think unity in the West means something different than unity in the East means. Mm. Um, uh, it's, it's a mostly ecclesiological thing. But, um, yeah, I think, I mean, for, for Westerners, uh, unity came to mean uh, a uniform liturgy and, um, well, for many, ultramontanism. Um Unity didn't mean, mean that in the Middle Ages. So it's a, it's a historical development of modern times. Um, well, certainly before Trent, there was uh, liturgical diversity in the West. Even there was the more, West. yeah. Uh, although it was always headed in the direction of increasing uniformity. Um, but even after Trent, uh, you know, the Dominican Rite was permitted, mm-hmm. uh, the Mozarabic Rite was permitted, and the Ambrosian Rite was never abrogated either. So, so those could, those could continue to be celebrated too. Um, I, I, I would guess uh, that the most common rite that was suppressed was the Gallican. Uh, but again, it, things have been moving in that direction for a long, long time. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the, there's there's a lot of issues, and and uh, um, you know, unity is a is a difficult thing to come by these days. And if yeah, I think I think if people do not feel um, unity in the liturgy, it's going to be pretty hard to feel it anywhere else. Mm. So let's talk about one more place that we both are concerned with, which is England. Uh, in England, Catholicism was very badly persecuted, as you mentioned. Uh, I mean, Henry VIII and Elizabeth, I don't even think, approached Cromwell, who was really... Uh, 
he was not only Catholics, but many, uh, even the... Irish. Even, everybody, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you name a person, you name a, a religion other than his very strict views of his own. So even what would today be like a high Anglican would have been just persecuted yeah. like by Cromwell. Right, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but today in England, more people attend Catholic Mass each Sunday than attend an Anglican service. Yes. So the Catholic Church in that sense is stronger in England now than the Anglican Church, which is the official church of the country. Yeah. I mean, the Queen has to, the Queen is the head of their church, right? Where do you see things going in, in England now? Because in England, uh, it, it still has a powerful cultural influence over the rest of the world, not the rest of the world, but many parts of the world. Uh, so the Anglican Church is, is splintering and, and falling apart. Uh, how do you view Catholicism in that country now? Well, it can be. I think it can be. Uh, it can be easy to be too sunny about Catholicism in England, because a lot of the Catholics in those pews are Polish descended or Irish descended. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly, there are a lot of converts to Catholicism. There are, the people there are who con- well, have I mean, left one, the Anglican well, Church. Well, one of the remarkable things, of course, is that some of the best literature written in the last couple of centuries are Anglophone convert Catholics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh, and, uh, among a whole host of others. Um, yeah, where I work in England, in the city of Chester, they even have a mass in Polish. So I mean, yeah. this is not a oh, small yeah. community. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, it's it's. Um, I, I now that have all that having been said, that one could be too sunny about the prospects of the Catholic Church in England. Um, it is uh, a moving thing that, as you say, when you, when you go there and you, and you attend a Catholic Mass, um, there are going to be a heck of a lot more people at that Catholic Mass than there will be in the Anglican Communion service down the road. Mm. Um, and this was, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Anglican Church ran into serious problems pretty early on. Um, especially in the early 18th century, for instance, uh, after the Glorious Revolution, uh, you had you know some people say, "Well, there's no religion in England," or and and, and things to that, um, things of that uh, sort. Uh, it also explains the phenomenal success of Wesley uh, in 19th sorry in 18th century England. Here was a guy who was actually giving them some good old-fashioned uh, Protestant evangelicalism. Uh, caught on like wildfire in Wales uh, and some other places in England and then of course here in the United States, uh, here in the uh, in North America. Um, but the, it, there's there's no question but that uh, Anglicanism is in a very bad way. Uh, it doesn't seem to, the leadership seems to be all over the place. Um, there is still an Anglo-Catholic wing of the Anglican world. That's the uh, branch that Newman came out of, for instance, mm. but it's minority and uh, uh, English traditionalists always sort of want to pin their hopes on uh, Anglo-Catholicism, and it's been a disappointment mm-hmm. you know, for two hundred years. It, it just doesn't it just doesn't go anywhere really. Um, well, I think the notion is if you're going to be this, why not just be Catholic? And that or, um, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's one possible response to it. Another response, would bo- another possible response is why bother at all? Hmm. Um, but, uh, and it, 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 you know, a church has to do what a church is supposed to do. The, cat, the Christian church, regardless of denomination, is, to put, is as St. Paul said, to preach Christ crucified. And I think the churches that are in trouble don't do that nearly often enough. They're they're uh, more taken over by um, you know s- cultural and social movements and whatnot. Um, the the Italian philosopher Augusto del Noce predicted a lot of this back in the early back in the late '60s. In fact, uh, uh, now he was more interested in the example of Catholicism. Uh, but he, uh, he was convinced already in 1968, just coming right out of the council, uh, that uh, um, those Catholics, and I think the Christians generally, who, are, who make uh, social justice and whatnot their primary uh, preoccupation, they don't survive. Uh, because... There's got to be a why to the social 
justice movement and the why if the why is not jesus then then you don't need the church you could just you don't need the church they, they, they you know it's they're like the you know the parable talks about this is the seed thrown on rocky ground and it shoots up really fast because there's nothing really to impede the roots but then of course there's nothing to hold the roots in either and then when the, when the wind gets uh high they blow away and uh, um uh, so anyway, but, but what, uh, what, Del, what Del Noche had said, <clears throat> and, and you know, this is a longer discussion in Catholicism, the active life versus the contemplative life. If it's one or the other, it's not going to work. It's got to it's be a both hand. Mm. And uh, I think in too many Christian churches, uh, the, um, the, the, con the contemplative has almost entirely yielded to the, uh, uh, to the active, and that's a church that's going to atrophy. Well, a lot of the, the as in England, while the Protestant Reformation didn't start there, it had maybe the greatest splintering there into so many different groups. But many of those groups simply do not exist anymore or are so, so, so weakened as to uh, be almost irrelevant in terms of the, the religious landscape of England or in, in Anglophone countries. Um, I, do you see that? What do you see the reason for that being? Like... Um, so, I mean, as you say, Wesley had a big impact, but the Methodists aren't really strong in England anymore. So, I mean, it, it had a giant rise up, but then a precipitous fall back down. Well, I will, I will, I will say this, and, and mind, uh, I'm a Catholic. I think it's tougher for Protestants to make certain arguments than Catholics. I think it's, it's, I think it's easier for Catholics to sort of defend our teaching and our ideas than it is for, for them. And that's contributed mightily to the, you know, to to the uh, to the problems. Um, <clears throat> so, for, you know, for instance, uh, uh, you know, the, the talk about sola script, sola scriptura. Scripture doesn't even talk about that, hmm. right? Um, <clears throat> or a literal interpretation of the Bible. Now, look, again, here's the way from the chaff, right? Uh, uh, we have a tradition of literal. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we in the Catholic Church say that the letter is very important but there are other things going on besides but when you say that only the letter is important then you run into all sorts of problems mm. all sorts of problems that are that that cannot be uh that cannot be uh um reconciled in any way and then it becomes unreasonable and if it's not reasonable it's just it's but not going to survive. I think it's not a rational look at the Bible because the Bible is composed of many different books from, written from many different eras. And it was the, the scripture is really part of tradition because the Catholic Church decided here are the things that are important that we're going to collect and call them scripture. And that tradition existed before scripture. Yeah, exactly right. Right. Uh, and so that we look, say, at the gospel very differently than we would look at, um, say, a prophetic book in the Old Testament right. or a history of the Old Testament, right. things like this, that we say not, not that they're not important, but that they're different, and they're written differently for different audiences with different literary techniques. Um, but the Gospels to us have a, a uh, they're primary. They rise above everything else. So the, the uh, Gospel trumps everything else. Yeah, as in Judaism, Torah uh, Trump, trumps everything else. Yeah, exactly right. Um, yeah, uh, so, I, so I think, you know, uh, and I, I have to say, I've had Protestant friends tell me uh, that there are certain things about <clears throat> the teaching of their churches that they, that they struggle mightily with. Mm. Um, which is not to say Catholics don't struggle mightily with things, to, but, but I think uh, it's a, um, <clears throat> I think it's a, a, a it's a, it's a more uh, it's a it's a bigger issue for them. Um, now uh, that's all I actually want to sort of say about that because I want to sp I don't really want to speak too much for my Protestant brothers and sisters because it would be uncharitable. But but at least from a from my point of view as a Catholic looking at it, that's one that that's an, an immediate reaction that I have. The Anglican right within the Catholic Church that was founded by Pope Benedict is now attracting a lot of people precisely because of the liturgical conservatism. Um, and they, they and, it's, and it's beautiful worship. It, I've absolutely attended beautiful. a number of those masses, yeah. and they're gorgeous. Um, but they use uh, their use of language is very poetic, right? Um, and they maintain a lot of the traditions that in the West we've thrown out, right? Um, in other words, they're very highly in tune to the smells and bells of of liturgical worship, yeah. right? What do you see as this 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 right inside of the Western right? So it's kind of unique. 
in that it's almost like an Ambrosian rite or something, where it's still inside the Western rite, it's not an Eastern rite, right. but it's substantially different Correct. than the traditional Roman rite. Right. Well, I would hope, and, and um, you know, people have said this about uh, Benedict's Samorum Pontificum, that uh, these other rites might be able to, um, or that, or that even, even for folks who don't, you know, <clears throat> attend the ordinary uh, masses, <clears throat> or who don't uh, attend uh, the 62 Missal. But there, there might be aspects of those liturgies f that could enrich the Novus Ordo. Um, that, that would be my, that, that's always my hope. It still is my hope. Um, <clears throat> I, I remember when I first got to Notre Dame and uh, um, the 10 o'clock Mass is always said to be a solemn Mass. And it was no Usardo, but there were plenty of smells and bells and, and this, that, and the other. And, um, and singing in Latin. And some, sing, and some singing in Latin. And uh, I, I, I just loved those liturgies. They were fantastic, very prayerful. I'll tell you one story about one of them. I was at one of these, and the fellow was sitting in front of me. I uh, had, had these kind of Humphrey Bogart tough guy looks, right? kind of guy you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. The communion uh, reflection was Mozart's Ave Verum Corpus. He turned around, there were tears rolling down his cheeks. Mm -hmm. One of the most beautiful things, one of the most moving things I've ever seen in my life. Um, medieval monks used to pray for the gift of tears. That is the, 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 the giftedness to feel God's presence such that all that one could do was, was weep. Mm. Now that's a high bar, I, 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 I grant you. but. I think that would be a, a wonderful thing for, um, for liturgy, that, that liturgy move us in, in such a way that the presence and the love of God is so manifest there. And of course, right, the, the, one of the beliefs about liturgy is it, it is where heaven and earth mm. converge, uh, that it's an image of what happens in heaven. And that's, that's what ought to be kept in mind. Mm. That's an image of what ought to be, uh, it's an image of what happens in heaven. Uh, and uh, um, uh, you know, all all liturgy should be ordained toward that reality. I agree with you 100 percent on that, and I think the best way to transmit the Catholic intellectual tradition is with a strong liturgy. Uh, because when you say these things, uh, say in the, in the Eastern tradition, in the Byzantine rite, we say so many things that are just quotations from councils. Yes. You know, it is truly proper to glorify yep. you and things like this. All of these prayers that are so, so deep theologically. Right. And the Roman rite too, so these prayers that are so deep theologically. So if you say these every week, you every time you say them, you so maybe when you're eight years old and you hear it, you understand 5%. But then you hear when you're 10 years old, you understand 10%. And by the time you're an adult, you understand this much better, right? It takes a long time to understand this. So it's fantastic that you have to hear it every week. When you look at the, the art on the walls, you know, the, the, these, the art in the beginning, iconography was mainly aimed at people who could not read. Right. This is the way to transmit the faith <clears throat> to people who cannot read. Mm -hmm. And as you say, now that we only read tweets and <laughs> things like this, we're, we're almost a non-literate society again, right? We, we like the images more than we like the words. So the, the icons and the, the, the unbelievable tradition of art from the Catholic Church is, is, is so powerful in transmitting the faith and deep, deep, deep theological issues. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think the, the, some of the most amazing things about the Catholic intellectual tradition is the art, the music, the literature, the science, everything that developed within it. Um, uh, in the in the, the papal encyclical Excordia Ecclesi, he, he explains this that the 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 church the universities the, right, these centers of thought come from the heart of the church, right? The church was responsible because, as you said before, the the church looks at everything in the world as being good in the sense that yeah, art is good and music is good and, and everything is good, but it, ha it has to be directed in the proper way. And uh, many other religions don't see that. I think. Uh, and I think the Protestant Reformation negated a lot of that, that they didn't see that. So they were very anti-smells and bells. Well, and, and a lot of iconoclasm. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, all the old uh, uh, cathedrals in England, the, the heads and the statues have been knocked off. Yeah. And a lot of the stained glass windows were destroyed to be replaced only by clear glass. Yeah. I mean, even candles were thrown out, things yes, that, that we yeah. wouldn't even see as, yeah. as ornate in any yeah. sense. Calvin hated the organ. Oh.
Said it was too sensuous. <laughs> I don't think anybody today would think the I, organ is too I, Yeah, I, I, that's, it's not an opinion that, I've, uh, that I share, but the, the, he said so. I've heard one person say the saxophone didn't belong in church because it was too sensuous, but never the organ. Uh. Well, I agree that the saxophone doesn't belong in church, but I don't think for that reason. All right, so I'll give you one last chance to say any final thoughts you have about uh, all of the things we discussed. Yeah, um, and, and again, this is something uh, that uh, I've begun to reflect on, I think, more lately. <clears throat> The famous, uh, it's, you know, the quote is most famous, I suppose, from Anselm, credo ut intelligam, I believe so that I may understand. Uh, and, uh, but uh, there's, there are similar quotes in Augustine and, and so on. Um, uh, I would just uh, encourage uh, particularly young people uh, who, if they are religious, to not um, let anybody tell them that to be religious is to be anti-intellectual or to be obscurantist. It's clearly not. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the things that Stephen Barr says in this uh, book of his on uh, the relationship between his being a Catholic and quantum physics, he says, I think that quantum physics makes more sense to me because I'm a Catholic. And John Henry Newman had said, all human endeavor begins uh, all, human, all human endeavor depends on faith, and it does. Um, faith is a part of our lives. Now, some of us put faith in one thing, some of us put faith in another. Okay? But you will put faith in something, and it may as well be Jesus. And then go from there. Excellent. That's an excellent way to end. So we thank Dr. Schaffron for joining our podcast today. Thanks for having me.